what we're going to do is it's our round table. And today we're going to be talking with a number of people and bringing information in from our Facebook page. People have comments, people have thoughts, people want to participate. You're part of this conversation too. And Corey is going to be keeping track of that stream. She will be following that. So put your comments in, put your questions in, put your information in. So I'm going to kick us off. And I have a panel of folks who live experience, have clinical experience, have background, have ideas, have thoughts, have opinions. And what we're going to do is we're going to share out a little bit to start with. And once we complete that, we're going to move forward in the discussion because we want to go somewhere. And when we want people, put your hands up, everybody, get your hand up by your face. <laughs> yeah, everybody. Yeah. We want people to see us. And we want them to notice that we have something to share with them. And we want to do it in a very respectful way. But we want to say, turn, now turn yourselves this way. So that we're both looking at this thing. And we want to say, I want you to take a look at what we're showing you here. Because what we're showing you represents people living with dementia, their families, and their care providers. And what we're seeing is not working for a lot of people. And we know that when you started all this, you thought that what you put up there for managing this virus was a great idea. I need you to look because when you look, you will see that's not working because what you did, do this, is you didn't realize it was gonna take everyone to support people living with dementia. And they should never ever have been shoved into places, left alone in places, or ignored. Because their needs are different than people who are cognitively intact and able to do things on their own. It's sort of one of the definitions of living with dementia. It doesn't mean people shouldn't have a voice, they should always have a voice. But there was a missing piece there, too, <laughs> because they weren't always given voice. So what I'm going to say is that after 40 years of working and living um, and doing things throughout the world of dementia, from education through clinical settings into the hospice world, into the community, um, institutional and otherwise, I came up with ways and strategies to help us support people living with dementia, whether they're in a residential program or whether they're at home, whether they're living on their own with support or whether they're living with others with support. And what I can tell you is the system that was devised to deal with the coronavirus, in my mind, never took that group into account with the special needs. And so what has happened is not an okay thing to have happened. Um, families and, and staff were starting to feel like they had to be separated or families were forced into a relationship that was 24 seven, that was beyond what they were able to handle. So what I propose is that we need to go, whoa, time out, let's pause. This is four months in and we aren't on a short course. We're on a fairly long journey here. So we need to revamp because this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, and in a marathon, you've got to have a full team. And we need to figure out who's on this team and how we support one another to move this forward in a reasonable fashion. So I'm going to introduce someone who I've talked to before to kick us off with further discussion. And that is Mary Daniel. And Mary Daniel, I'm going to let you do your own sort of sharing out of who you are, what, you, what you're about, where you've come from, and what you see moving forward. Because I want everybody to sort of share out what's your, what's your move forward. Thank you, Tifa. Um, I um, am a wife. That's how I got um, here. And um, I am married to Steve Daniel. I've been married to Steve for 24 years. And seven years ago, he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 59. Uh, a year ago, I placed him in uh, an amazing memory care center. He was thriving. And um, because he's social, he's a social, he's a salesman, always has been and loves relationships. I had him locked in his, in this house, literally deadbolted in the house. And 
he needed to be with people all day long. And it was a perfect fit. He's uh, at Rose Castle in Jacksonville and um, loved it there. They call him the mayor and um, everybody knows him. I saw him on March the 10th and they called me on March, like I do every day, by the way. I went every single day, got him ready for bed. We laid in bed and watched television every single day and uh, he would drift off to sleep. It was a great way for both of us to end the day. And um, that was the uh, last time was March 10th. And on March 11th, they called me and they said, you can't come back. So I asked them if Mary, I could get a job. So Mary, I want to pause there for a second because I want us to be very clear. That community was not saying, Mary, you may not come back. That community was saying, we've received notification. Correct from and guidelines from our authority figures that say no families may visit. Correct. No yes. visitors, no None. visitors. Okay. No, and I said- I want us to, yeah, cause I don't want that fractured to be thought this- No, 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 and I am a huge fan of Rose Castle. So I, I absolutely, okay. they're, they're, they're a, a wonderful part of my story. And um, you're exactly right. Thank you for clearing that up. It was obviously them taking directives from the state and telling them in all good intention, we have to stop this and we have to protect our most vulnerable and right now you can't come back. Well, I started um, immediately saying, okay, there's gotta be another way. How can I get in? I've got to be able to get in. I've gotta be able to see him. I can volunteer, can I get a job? And they said, let's just sit tight and see what happens. We have no idea what this looks like. Maybe this is gonna be over in a couple of weeks. And as weeks turned into months, I started getting a little bit louder with my local press and talking to them um, about, you know, the, the, this is a bad idea. This is not working. This is not working. And I am thrilled that Rose Castle noticed that and called me completely out of the blue um, about a month ago and said, we understand you would like to work at our facility and we have a job for you. So I took a job as a dishwasher. Um, I go in two days a week and I wash dishes. It is the real deal. I had to do everything that everybody else has to do, drug test and, and background check and COVID test and TV test and all kinds of training. And I now go in and I wash dishes um, two days a week to be able to be with him. And it is a, an amazing blessing. Um, but I can't, that's not the end of the story. I mean, it's a wonderful love story. It has caught, caught the attention of media all over the world, truly all over the world. And, um, but that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is there's too many people that can't see their loved ones two days a week. And I'm going to tell you, I'm selfish. I want to see him seven days a week. Two days a week is not enough. Is that, is that selfish or is that better for Steve? Oh, it's, it's absolutely better for both of us, for him too. Oh, okay. and, and maybe greedy, you know, I think of it in terms of, I know that there are people out there um, that would love to have two days a week. And um, okay. it's yes. just not enough. It's not, I mean, and I'm, I'm only seeing, I'm seeing him on Thursdays and Fridays, which is hard. I wish it was more like Mondays and Fridays or something, or, you know, Tuesdays and Fridays, because I see him two days back to back. And then I have to go six days without seeing him. And I know that's, that's difficult for him. Yeah. Um, because again, I'm there and then all of a sudden now I'm gone again. And yeah. So it's just a mess. And, and my story, uh, as, as fun and as wonderful and as great a love story as it is, that's not the story. I mean, it has opened the door. I'm thrilled that it has opened the door for me to get the attention of our media to say, we, th th we just have to do better than this. There has to be a better way. And so that's where we are. For you, the idea is there's got to be ways for families who seek those relationships, seek to be part of care, to be part of care in a reasonable, safe, logical fashion. Absolutely. Okay. No harm. I absolutely don't want to. In fact, I mean, I'm taking extra precautions. I have had seven COVID tests in the last three weeks. Um, I take one. My brother-in-law is a physician, and I'm thrilled that I can take one, a, a rapid test. I take it at 4 p.m. My shift starts at 5 so I know when I walk in on Thursdays at 4 p.m. that I just got tested and I just have a negative result. So I take this very seriously. I do not want to bring it in. I do not want to be the person who brings it in. You don't want to be that person. So No, no. And, there's, yeah. and it's not there. So, I mean, right. it's, it's it really important that we follow the rules and we do this right. Um, yep. But it's getting in there. To think that this is working, it's not working. I mean, no. there are places, I mean, you, you go to our Facebook page, um, 
um, caregivers for compromise and their story after story. There was one this morning where they have 90 residents who have tested positive. I mean, yeah. we're just talking about it's not working. It's getting it's not, Yeah, it's like, guys, you know? pause. Let's look. It, it's seriously not working. And those are places where families are not involved. Those are Correct. places where we're just talking staff and residents. Correct. And I think that's really important. So thank you, Mary. And so your vision is we've got to come up with strategies that are reasonable, logical, supportive of well-being, but acknowledge this is not working. And, right. and in so many ways, they're not working. It's more than one thing that's not working. And it's not, it's not safe, but it's also not okay. I mean, Steve craving your, your time, he's in, in want, in need for six, you know, six days in a row. And then you pop up for two days and then you go away again right. without logic, without reason. And his brain is not capable of holding on to, well, you know, it's the coronavirus and, she'll and he be doesn't back know and I'm washing dishes. He can't understand that. I'm can't understand what you do is you have to dishes. come in and work. You can't just come in and visit. Yeah, he doesn't no. realize what a wonderful wife I am. To yeah, just I mean, you know, it's a good thing you have those dishwashing skills down. That's good, Mary. I, I, thank you, Mary. Maggie, Margaret, Maggie. Yeah, tell us about you. I'm from the other side of the door of Mary's life. I'm a memory care director here in Naples, Florida, the epicenter of the world. Um, I am also <laughs> <Is it> ever? <laughs> an educator for our property. It's been unique teaching, you know, the positive physical approaches with gloves and masks. <laughs> yeah. You think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we can do it. It's just, it's We've got just... that safe space down pat now. <laughs> we know all about like in private space now. <laughs> um, what we've come across since March with the mandate coming down is trying to find ways to keep our relationships open. So we've done the window visits, the video visits, the phone visits. We do cards and letters. We even opened up a Facebook page just for my memory care. Um, but, you know, my residents, they don't understand masks. They nope. don't do safe space. Nope. So we've had to put them in like a bubble to keep them, them safe because they hug each other. They hold hands. Humans I mean, are meant to be humans. I mean, we have two of these in hands for a reason. This is how we show one another. We love one another. This is not a threat. This is meant to be comfort. And the whole one person per table during bingo is like a debate of the Congress. <laughs> Wait, no, she sits here. She sits here. She's my friend. What are you doing? Quit it. Yeah. Yeah, one person per table, that's ridiculous. We're wasting all this space. <laughs> she can sit here, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I help her, you know, they, they don't understand. They actually do. What they are telling us all is we feel safe enough to be present with each other because we live with each other. It's a family. In our households, how many of you go around with your kids all wearing masks 24 seven and when you eat, you eat at separate tables? How many yeah. of you do that? We don't. This is the illogic of the logic. It's like we're a family when we move into community like that. That's the whole point of that community is to create this supportive family family. And it should involve two families, that professional family and that family family, because that's what we should have been thinking of in the first place. So I'm curious, Margaret, so you guys are trying really hard still to keep those social distances in your common spaces. In our common spaces um, with our residents as much as we can. So like during, we're trying to keep their activities, keep them engaged throughout the day. But we try to do the six feet apart for exercise. We try to do one person per table for bingo. We're trying to make their life as normal as possible for them. It just adds twice as workload onto us because Ooh, we're trying so, to So safe. on your staff, would you say their just stress level is here, here, or, oh, no, I'm cool. I'm fine. I'm, I'm it's cool. probably at an eight because they love their residents mm -hmm. and they've had all these extra things put on them. We're the only emotional, you know, touch they get through the day now. Wow. So we've had to take on that role as their family, their friend, along with their caregiver. Yeah. You know, so how are family, how are you, how are you guys feeling the distress of families where you're at? 
my families have been very supportive. They understand, but they're stressed out. So we try to make appointments so that everyone can get window visits. And window visits work great with your diamonds and your emeralds, but by the time you get to like your ambers and your rubies, they have no concept and they can't figure it out. No. And it upsets them terribly. So that was one of the things I think Mary experienced with Steve is the window visits were pretty distressing because even though at the time he was emerald or he is emerald in an emerald state, he gets lost in time and place. He can't understand why she won't come in. And it's, right. it, it be, increases that risk of elopement or attempt for elopement to get with the person you want to be with and not stay with the people you're with. Yeah. So yeah. we've tried lots of different things. Um, my families are really, I'm happy with the Facebook because we're posting, we try to get pictures of everybody on Facebook being engaged. That way they can see, you know, mom, you know, still playing her bingo, you know, dad's mm -hmm. still, you know, so they're still engaged. So your staff has got to be exhausted because they, 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 they you haven't gotten more staff, have you? You haven't got new staff in there, have you? No, they don't give you extra staff to make up for family members. <laughs> And there family members were a part of your team. About that. Yeah, clearly family members were a part of your team. So where do you see this going, Maggie? Our, what would you what like? I would really love, uh, my next step I think would be a safe step that most of us responsible assisted livings could handle is have us a visit room set up. Let these families come in, you know, instead of just doing a window visit, have them come in with a mask on and visit their loved one in a secured room that we can disinfect. Let them have that time with them. I mean, I think my families, they would do just about anything. They would join the every two week COVID test party if yeah. it meant they could be with their loved one, even for, you know, in a secured room that we had to clean. So at least see them physical in contact, physical time and space together. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, Dr. Jennifer Rucci, we're gonna bring you up and, and put you center stage here. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me on, Tipa, and, and it's an honor to be here with uh, your PAC team and with you, Mary, and, and I guess I bring a, another perspective to the care team puzzle, um, and that's the medical team side. So uh, I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, actually by training, and, and helped to develop, goodness, about seven years now, a really holistic, um, whole person-centered uh, care team between primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, social workers, psychotherapists, and psychiatrists like myself, and, and really have been looking um, specifically at long-term care residents, and, and I have a lot of um, experience and expertise as a geriatric psychiatrist in dementia, at, at understanding the entirety of, of folks' needs. And that includes, has always included the families as part of that care team. We hold a lot of family meetings and family therapy and, and things that really help bring together, because I can't do my job without the families. Um, and the patients that have supportive families and, and folks like you, Mary, involved do better any day, you know, pre-COVID. Um, and what I've seen, you know, uh, I'm now the chief medical officer of our company um, that services amongst five different states and, and really have seen hundreds of nursing homes and long-term care facilities, um, memory cares go through this. And, and I've seen an extreme variety of reactions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at first, and, and really, I do believe people had the right intentions. People really were attempting to protect the most vulnerable. We had very little evidence as to what this virus was and what it would do other than we knew it was very dangerous for older people. And so I think there was a lot of federal and state-based rules right off the bat to just put everybody on lockdown, even the public, you know, at first. Um, but I, I worry a lot about the unintended consequences of that um, for, our, for our residents, but even for the public. I mean, there has been an increase in depression and really sad things everywhere. Uh, and naturally speaking, we would see that with our patients too. And, and I think that, um, again, good intentions at first, but there have been a lot of, of consequences because it's not just families that are being, you know, uh, unable to visit. You know, you've got clergy that are part of the important family. The hairdresser can't come in. How important was getting their hair cut done every week to these residents? And, and really, sometimes even we can't come in, you know, for a long time and, and still in some places, the mental health support team is been considered a visitor. And so we've been unable to, you know, continue with that relationship that our behavioral therapists have had and been an important part of that team. Yeah. So Jennifer, as you've seen a variety, but I know that your communities are 
one of those communities that was identified as a high performer. When there were infections below, before, you know, whatever they were, neurovirus or, or any of those things, you guys, if you found it and you caught it early, you were very good, I will bet, at getting it under control in short order, you got, you have a protocol, you followed that protocol and you were out of the woods in relatively short order. I, I think have, so. And you have fairly stable staff. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's true. And you have leaders that are fairly stable mm -hmm. in their positions. Mm -hmm. So tell me on the other side of the street, cause you're, you've been in the world long enough. What about communities that don't have those resources to start with? They have unstable staff, unstable leadership, problems with, with infection control. They have workers who English is second language um, as a primary because that's who's taking the positions within those settings because of either funding or access or resources. So we have people who are having trouble with language themselves, um, with understanding and following and training was not necessarily beyond anything with a video and maybe that. So tell me, you've got to have experience in that area. What about those areas and, and the risks that come about with saying isolate in rooms, isolate people? What do you well, think about that? I mean, I think, you know, um, even those homes have really learned a lot. I've been kind of impressed, mm -hmm. you know, truth. And, and all of, all of the, the facilities that I've seen, all these homes have come a long way. I mean, we started off this entire thing with very little knowledge, with very little PPE, and with very little ability to test people. Right. And I think bringing those things to all types of homes has made a huge difference. And so what I saw in the beginning, even in the good homes that had good infection control practices, they were having pretty significant outbreaks yeah. at first. I don't see that the same way necessarily as much as I did it in the beginning because we're able to now get folks, generally speaking, tested quickly. We're able to educate. We've spent a lot of time educating the staff um, in, in different languages, in fact, you know, about PPE, how you wear a mask. We've made videos about um, different things and, and we've made an effort from the medical side um, to provide that leadership to the buildings that maybe don't have that. Internal. Yeah. So we've come a long way in acknowledging the infection side of the street. What about the dementia side of the street? Not as well as I would like. Um, I think, you know, I think, but I think those two things are connected because since we've come that way with the infection side, we now can probably better reconsider what we're doing on the other side. Okay. Um, because again, now that we've put in place those, um, those methods that we know work. We know PPE works. I mean, if, if it didn't, the folks that were taking care of people in the hospital on COVID units all day, every day would all be sick, but yeah. they're not yeah. um, because these things do make a difference. And, and if we could now help to re-educate and kind of circle back this conversation and say, okay, well, now that we have these safety measures in place, we really need to look at what we've done to people because I, I can't tell you how many stories from folks with dementia of isolation and the, the things they told me even just yesterday in seeing patients. Yeah. So for you, it's time to revamp because it is a marathon. This is not a sprint and we've got to regroup and reconnect and let's look at our evidence. Let's look at the evidence. And I would add the evidence of people at different points in their dementia need different kinds of support. And we need to build that in with family and staff combined. But from the very beginning, I'll come back because I want to, your, your group made a decision. We are not going to isolate people in single rooms. We are going to work in a unit recognizing a community mm -hmm. in a, in a unit kind of thing. So we'll, I think we'll come back to that if we could later on, but thank you, Jennifer, for that, for that really great side of that story, which is the medical support side, because we, we, we want to have medical support in place for sure. Mm -hmm. So next up, Mary Ann Oglesby, which is going to be a totally different perspective. Um, this is someone, and we're going to talk about the people who are now at home without support. <laughs> because it's hard in a community without the right support of everyone. But what happened there was the opposite. 
Families were told, do it on your own. You're not allowed to have any support services around you. You can't have the support services anymore. So you guys go off and handle it 24 seven in your home without anything. So Marianne, go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and your perspective on it. Um, it's great to be here and thank you. Um, I was a family practice nurse years ago um, in Texas. And so that was at the beginning of dementia, you know, dementia was that everyone just assumed that they all were quote had mental issues and they just, there was nothing done with them. And so I always had a, um, I always looked at them when they would come in my office and they would have an ER or they were coming in for a follow-up and they would say that mental health evaluation, da, da, da. but they didn't act like the people that we got that truly had mental health issues when they came in for their checkups. Most were elderly, even at that time. And so it, I, it just piqued my interest. And so eventually I started working in a program like the Veranda. I'm the director of the Veranda here in Tennessee. And and it's a respite program, same type, same amount of hours. Everything is the, totally the same as it was in Texas. And that program has been in existence for 20 years. So ours has been in it for eight. And I've seen a lot of things change the face of dementia, but none quite like COVID has. And for us, our families all live at home. And our, and our um, clients, as we call them, they live at home as well. And so when we closed in March, I kept up with all of our families every day. How are you doing? How are they doing? Of course, the number one thing, they all went to bed and slept. You could not hardly get them out of the bed. They would not get out of the bed. They were bored. They were used to being in an activity program where they were the rock stars for four hours and they got to do what they wanted to do and what they were capable of doing. Now they're thrown into home, very hard to get home health services. And if COVID comes into the play, you can just forget it. They just will not hardly do that. And so it's been tough for me to try to figure out how to help them at home. We're working on a new plan to do that. I think it'll work well, but, but we have to figure out new ways if this lasts a long time, how do we get the care to the homes? Because the behavioral health side of this is huge because mama gets really mad and then daughter gets really mad. And then there's this blow up and no one wins. It's just a constant battle. And, um, and so I only, I have a story because I think for those that live at home, um, and are caring for their loved ones. We had a 72 year old client who asymptomatic less than three weeks ago had a drop in blood pressure and he goes to the ER because something out of, they don't know what happened, but something happened that caused his blood pressure. He goes to the ER, he goes to one hospital, they do a COVID test, but they feel like for sure, because there are no, symptom, no symptoms, didn't present not one symptom, that he could go to a different hospital. And so that by ambulance, he, had took, he took two trips, the first one to the hospital, the second one from hospital A to hospital B, which was in a different town. It, it just is the way it is in the COVID world. So he gets there. And his wife goes in and she takes care of him. They speak, they walk up and down the hall, no symptoms, none. And so he eats, they love on each other. Um, this was on a Friday, actually July the 3rd, Friday, July 4th, everything was great until about six o'clock and the word came down that he was COVID positive. It was such a shock that they truly, the nurses couldn't believe it. They just couldn't believe it. So it was about five, shift change seven. The nurses told the wife, you know what? You stay here for a couple hours. Wait till after shift change. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. And so she did. She sat there for two hours. They talked. He told her he loved her. She told him she loved him. And then about seven, he was whisked away to the COVID unit. That was on Saturday night late. On Wednesday... On Monday, she was tested positive for COVID as well. So she asked me, she said, what do I do? And I said, well, I think you have to be the lion that roars for your husband. And you're gonna have to roar really loud because now he's in a place that you can't get to anymore. And so you're gonna have to be his voice. And so she did. And on Wednesday, she brought him home. 
Both of them had it. And this is what she said. If I die and he died and we die together, fine. But I can't take the separation not knowing. And so with a lot of issue, they brought him home and she brought home a different person than the person she kissed goodbye. And so it was not such a good time. And um, we finally brought in hospice. And so we had his service last week. And the position it has put that family in has been terrible because it's not just the person with dementia and the wife, it included the children then. It included the aunts and the uncles. It included a whole group of people that now have been touched by it. And the dementia kind of took a back seat, but yet still had it not been for the dementia. And so those families that, that live that on a daily basis, there is no support. Lots of them end up in behavioral health. Yeah. And let's just be very clear. They had been living in their own home, no COVID at yes. all. So we know that that journey that he took yes. um, presented the COVID. That's yes. where he got it. It had wow. to, I mean, there was no way that he had it when they were alone. So somehow in that process in seeking medical support, yes. unfortunately it resulted ultimately in his death. Wow. But you know, I mean, we've, we've handled it well, because what do you do? Yeah. But the fact is that because he was such an, um, he, he had worked all his life for one company, 38 years wow. for one company. And so he, he was a CFO. He was a numbers person. He brought his things here that was numbers. He was very meticulous. When I went because of we're activity based, when I went to the home to say my goodbyes to him yeah. in PPE gear, I was determined I was going to say goodbye. I went in his office and on his door was napkins that we had given him from the program because we use pretty napkins because something as simple as a napkin that's colorful, not white, were taped from the top of his door to the bottom, a whole set of napkins. And when he sat at his desk, he, he had a face. He'd go, that, that, that place, that, that place. So I know people with dementia are capable of having a good life, but we've got to figure out a way to get our legislators yeah. to listen. Yeah. We've got to come together and say, this isn't working because people are dying. People yeah, are People hard still hard. die. People are still they, dying. And it's yes. how they live that matters, not it's, just it's, how they die. We do want them to that, die better. Right. So she made that happen. So she made it happen. And so she brought him home. And I, she's one of the strongest women I have ever known because the person she brought back was totally different. And I will add this, that a, someone called her from the place he was at. And she said, what is hospital psychosis because that's what they told her was the issue <laughs> and so she didn't know what that was so when the nurse called she, she asked that question and they pretty much said because you took her out of the hospital took him out of the hospital it caused a psychosis which has led to the place that you're at so you caused his psychosis yes that's what they wow, told her. They told her that. They oh, that's her. so wrong. Oh and so, my. And I would let Jennifer Rucci say that, but I can say that. I mean, I mean, my yeah. jaw drops because that's not a, not hospital psychosis is when you're in the hospital, you develop a psychosis because you're in the hospital. Exactly. Let's quit blaming it on a family member. That is that same old, it's not my fault, dementia happened and that yeah. he was in an unfamiliar place with unfamiliar people doing unfamiliar things to him. Oh well, and in those units, they're not equipped for people with dementia. Well, if we're yeah, we, do that, <laughs> that's all too often this situation. Yeah. Keep oh, them in mind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. You're welcome. Right, I'm going to move us over to Beth Nolan, who is a member of our team, but has a background and has stories as well. So we want to hear a little bit more because we're all talking about change and we're all talking about reasonable change. But in order to talk about change, we want to make sure we lift up all the different issues. And so Beth is going to speak from a couple perspectives, uh, a family member, but also speaking as well from a research perspective. And yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear all these different stories. I think it's, um, 
worth it to mention what a situation, what sort of situation we had before COVID came. And I think that, you know, COVID just sort of unfortunately shown a very strong light on a system that's really struggling. And I have unbelievable heart-wrenching sympathies for each side. And that's kind of a little bit about the background of what I did. I, I would work with communities, long-term care, senior services, hospitals, primary care, mental health agencies to implement evidence-based practices. And one of the things that was always, always, always key to consideration is the population of focus. Um, and so if we're looking at sort of any sort of potential group solutions that really have to involve, you know, potentially legislation to make things happen. But of course, legislation is only a minimum level of responding. It's, it's a stick most of the time and rarely a carrot. Um, but we do need those minimum standards. Um, they set the baseline for some of our more struggling communities. But even those places that are willing to take a good look at things, the piece that wasn't taken into consideration here is that there are differences in the population in all senior services. And that difference is we've got people with frontal lobe abilities living in senior services, and we have people without it. So with frontal lobe impairment creates a situation where you have an individual who can no longer sequence through their day they can no longer figure out how to transition from activity to activity. And that's our job. That's our job for them, with them, to look at a situation and decide, hmm, is this uh, uncomfortable? Is it <gasps> risky? Or is it actually imminently dangerous to life and limb at this moment? And I think that's the reaction that those of us supposedly who do have frontal lobes, that unfortunately was the reaction we had to COVID. But here's the deal. COVID is not our first infection that wipes out entire units. We have this seasonally, and I am not at all equivalent, equiv making equivalent COVID to annual flu. Flu, we have a vaccine and we can decrease risk of death and morbidity with it, or yeah, morbidity. COVID we don't. So I recognize the increased issue here and that's what I believe increased our, <laughs> feeling that this was extra risky, legitimately so. But here's the deal, unintentionally and without necessary consideration for those in this population with frontal lobe impairment or people living with dementia, we've created a situation whereby those folks are having very short little intervals of engagement during the day. And furthermore, we're trying to explain to them the same way that you would explain to your two and a half, three-year-old child and I use this very carefully because our older adults living with dementia are not toddlers. But in terms of safety awareness and frontal lobe function, I cannot look at anyone under the age of, I want to say, I'm not sure I could do it with my 14 year old daughter. Kid, you need to stay in your room at all times. Do not hug anyone, do not touch anyone. And I'm not saying just for 10 days, I'm saying for months at a time. So what we've got here is a situation where normally normally functioning adults would never look at a two-year-old child and say, I'm going to baby-proof this room like you wouldn't believe. I'm going to put lots of stuff in their room for them to engage with. And I'm only going to come in to do the basic stuff because that's all I can handle at this moment. No one would ever look at that and say, that is not torture to that child. So we have got CDC guidelines that are applied to people without the capacity to manage their lives in an entire nursing home, much less in a room. So we have increased risk to a level that we had no intention of doing. No one at the CDC said, I want to especially put people living with dementia at risk. And I want to handcuff staff in long-term care communities so they can't actually do the job they were barely holding on to before with the regulations as they were. And I want to take a group of people who've never been trained at the hospital level staff to handle PPE and infection control when their job is to love and care and bring life to people with frontal lobe impairment. And that's the piece that I think we are missing here. We've got better regulations on how to engage zoo animals than we do people living with dementia. The things that I cannot do to a polar bear in a cage, I am right now allowed to do to my mother living in long-term care. And that's the place where we need to say, this is not okay. We all need to take a deep breath and figure out CDC legislation, long-term care communities, home care agencies and families like this coming together and saying, this is cruel and unusual punishment and it cannot go on this way. 
And so Beth is approaching this not only as sort of a healthcare issue, but a human rights issue where we have individuals that have not been convicted of anything um, other than having brain failure. And in that, that, that conviction that we can do better, we know better than anybody else, there, that there's some guidelines above anything else about what you need to do well to thrive or at least survive. And I think one of the really we unspoken, except we talked about it the other day when I was talking with our other physician friend who said the rise in antipsychotic use and the rise in anti-anxiolytics, uh, anti-anxiety meds and anti-psychotics, which we have worked so hard, come on. Drugs are not a, a, a substitution that's acceptable because they impact the entire central nervous system. They are not selective. And they are not, those drugs were not designed for people who had prefrontal, frontal, or temporal lobe impairment. They were never designed. And so the other thing that we don't seem to be talking much about is falls, loss of physical function, loss of ADL function, loss of language, loss of ability to engage, loss of balance, coordination. I mean, we are not taught in sleep disturbances. We are talking about those things and we should be because that's what dementia, unfortunately, symptoms of things not going well. We can see this again and again, Tifa, when someone has a simple fall. I mean, it used to be when I was growing up, you know, 70s, 80s, someone broke a hip. That was like a death sentence. And now we, that doesn't, that's not the case, even with dementia. But when you have a hip fracture, it's a much riskier situation in dementia. So if we're talking about just preservation of life in terms of maintaining skill sets, we've got to support interaction and touch interaction in a safe way for both parties to maintain life. At the end, and I can't remember who said it, it was one of our family members with a horrible situation. They said that, what life am I saving my loved one for? If at the end of this, I come with a person that I, I can no longer interact with, even, and I'm not talking about, we know in PAC, you can interact to the very end, but how are we hastening that end? Yeah. And what if we lost in the in-between? Yeah. I mean, we are talking about who have. We are not talking about people who have active COVID. Even if we were, how do we support those people if their symptoms are minimal? I mean, because they're not going to behave. I mean, so if I have minimal symptoms or I'm active, how are you going to engage me? There's no guidelines on how to engage someone who's living with dementia, who loves to engage, who now has COVID. What are we going to do with those folks? Keep going, no, don't touch me. Get your hands up, back, sit down. Dr. Ruchi, we need some medication to manage this. We cannot have them going around the building like this. And that idea of, well, now they're a criminal with a history. It's like, now they've got a criminal history. And it's like, whoa, 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 this is not what we're talking about here. So I wanna open the floor for anybody else um, that we have not heard from who has something that with your experience, you want to say moving forward, you think, you want to contribute something to this moving forward as a community. Because we are talking about moving forward as a community and saying, here's where the holes, you see my fingers, how far they're spread apart. Those are the places where all the people living with dementia fell through. <laughs> I mean, they fell through because you took these two groups that were doing this. Now there were still holes. Let's not kid ourselves. There were problems. But now we took these two hands apart. And we're expecting this one hand to figure out what to do. And as Beth said, we handcuffed them. We said, you've got to do this and you got to do that and you got to learn this and you got to get this. And now they've had four months to get some of that stuff, but now let's look at the people that were needing support and care and that they really weren't. And I will be honest, in places where there was not a, there was just barely enough staff to start with, people were doing without. People did without. People are doing out without help at meals. People are doing without help getting change. People are doing without changes of briefs at the level that they should be or offers to go to the bathroom at the levels there should be. People are doing without exercise, moving up and down hallways, walking, sitting, up and down, up and down. People are doing without hydration. They are doing without. And it is not just we're not talking about nice, we're talking about essential. We're talking about essential. And that's what's missing. 
And without coming together, there's no way we're going to change that. There's just not the resources in place. It's the invisible being cared for with inadequate. I mean, it's just inadequate right now in many, many, in almost all cases, it's not enough to support people's living, maybe surviving, but not living and not surviving well. So who else on, the, on our, our group here in, among our folks would like to contribute something that you think might help us think through something or move something through here at this point? Ansley? Yeah. Uh, the, the place that I come from here, and, I, and I'm helping Mary Daniel um, kind of moderate this uh, growing Facebook group, um, Caregivers for Compromise. And I think we have, uh, we have, we're climbing up to nearly 7,000 people. So there are a lot of voices from a lot of, a lot of different situations. And, um, you know, um, it, and a lot of these people, you know, the, the thing that comes up so often is there will be people in the group that say, well, if it's so bad, why don't you bring your loved one home? And, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're all really good at judging other people's situations and trying to fix their issues. But there, there are so many of these situations that, that it's not possible, you know, for a, a loved one to be brought home. Where, you know, they may need a level of care that the 78-year-old wife who already has, you know, a physical disability cannot provide and doesn't have the means to bring in assistance to. So we're, we're seeing that a lot. But, um, you know, I think... <laughs> I think from my perspective, one of the things I've seen over and over again is um, that if, if we could um, come up with solutions, and, and this is an easy one, but if we could come up with solutions where the level of communication um, coming home is, you know, just a little bit better. Um, I've seen people are so frustrated because they can't get information. They're calling, they're leaving messages, they're asking, you know, they're saying, hey, I did a window visit, you know, and, and she looks terrible. What's wrong? You know, and, and over and over in the group, I'm seeing, you know, we all know that, that one of the most detrimental things to people living with dementia is to get a UTI and to be dehydrated. A, a, a UTI and somebody who's living with dementia can look like it's time to call hospice when all it is is a bag of fluids and, and when the staff are so um, overworked and, um, you know, and they've only got, what, five minutes, six minutes, an hour with, you know, a resident, they may not see that. They may not see or go, hey, this is what this is. And so, you know, I'm seeing these family members try to call, try to, you know, figure this out and not getting the calls back. And I think there's just tremendous frustration at the, at the inability to, to have communication that, right. And um, so that, that's huge. I, I, I had a call from a woman yesterday. Um, who, she literally called me and said, just wanted to let you know, they called me and said, my mom has declined so much since Friday that it, it's probably time to call hospice, which was shocking to me. And so I went over to see, you know, if I could see her to decide whether or not we should call hospice. And if so, if we were going to be able to get hospice support, then I haven't seen her in almost five months and I'm going to bring her home. You know, if we get, but uh, she got there and, um, and one of the, the staff members <laughs> after, you know, going back and forth about wanting to see her mom, just bring her to a window. I just need to lay eyes on her. I haven't laid eyes on her in, in nearly five months, bring her to a window and they wouldn't do it. And ultimately, ultimately the, the, um, uh, the facility actually called the police. And so the woman called me while she was sitting there waiting for the police to come. And, uh, so, you know, I think as these tensions and frustrations are running so high and mounting, you know, one of the greatest things that we have is just the ability to communicate better. And, um, and I know that's something that, you know, that Mary's been working so hard to try to get, you know, from, um, from our leaders is give us a time frame, give us an idea of what it's going to take, you know, in order to change these rules. 
Uh, and, and setting those expectations will help so much, but it's a communication thing. And, and that's, well, and this is where, do I have your permission to video record while I'm with your mom? Mm -hmm. Do I have your permission? You're her healthcare power of attorney. Will you allow me to do that? Let me bring my device in so we can video my work with her so you can see us interacting and that will give you maybe some idea of what's going on because I do want you to know now why five months I'm I mean I must say that is that to me is beyond what's okay Margaret is Maggie is saying we post on faith we've got people's permission we're posting on Facebook on a daily basis to let people know how their folks are doing what they're doing how they're being engaged. But what we have here is the total extreme in the opposite direction, which is I now am the warden of the prison and I've got to keep everything silent and quiet. And there is actually no regulation in regard to that. But there is this wall of, you know, HIPAA. And so that idea of this personal information, it's like, but there are ways to work around and with that for the, the support of that individual. Um, and it sounds like that's a willful hiding of information as opposed to a open and I don't know how to do this. If I truly don't know how to do this, this is the time to learn. Um, it is time to learn how to share information safely and well. That's another way. So you're absolutely right. So this idea of how can and should we be communicating at what frequency? Uh, and how do we bring somebody on board if we need to? How do we bring somebody whose primary focus is to keep this open communication if we don't have physical access? How do we do that? And if a window visit distresses, but maybe without a visual, the person watching can watch these interactions and see what's going on and then have a conversation with a care provider about what, what, what happened and how it went and what do you think, what should I try? That's including in a team without physical presence. And that is an option that I would put out there that we need to build in as an alternative. But it means we have to have tablets. We have to have sanitization of those tablets. And they're different than using hand sanitizer on them. You can't do that. You'll destroy the suckers. So you've got to know the rules about how to do that stuff. But once you know and once you build that in, that sort of really changes the dynamic. And so thank you, Ansley. That's a really important element, I think, of change is hello, we do need to have conversations with each other and they shouldn't be like this. This, this doesn't, forcing this does not help. Anyone else have a, a part or a piece they wanna put forward as, so I'm curious, how many of you have had legislators or CDC seeking information about how well this is going and whether or not there is change needed. I mean, is anybody evaluating the programs being provided other than the infection rate and the death rate for COVID? What are you seeing, Jen Jennifer, because I'm suspecting you're, I mean, is anyone seeking to ask the question, how are we doing for people who are living with brain failure? I think people are only now beginning to address this and talk about it, um, both locally and nationally, for that matter. I've seen, I'm part of a lot of physician groups nationally who, um, you know, we're all in panic mode at first, and now we're starting to say, well, wait a second, what, what are we doing? I mean, there are some serious, and you talk about falls, and you talk about prescription medications. We're starting to say, well, can we measure this too? I mean, there's also a lot to be said about, you know, everybody's got chronic medical issues too that are not necessarily being attended to. The falls are being increased because the podiatrist can't come and, and they're immobile in their bed. I mean, there, there's a lot of things going on that people didn't even think to ask about at first. And only now am I starting to see people say, wait a minute, I, I think we went a little too far. Yeah. So this is a prime time, it sounds like, for us to bring up some possibilities and give people some roadmaps. Because I think what people need is how, what do we do? 
and how do we do it? The why I think we've got, the why is solid, but the how do we do this? And what we tend to think it, at PAC, I will tell you at PAC, five options. We need five options. We can't just go with one because one will never meet everybody's needs and all we'll get is arguments. But if we have five alternatives of directions to travel and primary focus, that may help us get out of where we are right now. And there'll be another five that come from the other side so that when they come together, we actually match up. Because otherwise, guess what we're gonna build? I'm from Pittsburgh, guess what we're building? That would be a bridge to nowhere. A bridge to nowhere. So what we did is we actually both started off, but because we didn't have a common understanding of how we would come together, we bypass each other and we miss the mark. And that's the last thing we need to do. So as we're coming from these sides, working toward this common goal, and that common goal should be caring for the person right there. They should always be the center of what we're working on. And we have environment and we have care and we have activities and we have people. And that's what we're gonna work on. And, and we've got to figure out how when we come together, we're both coming together with this openness and this willingness to hear, wow, okay, well this person, maybe it's gonna look like this. This person, it might look like that. This person, it might, this one, maybe it's blue. But I think if we don't figure out how to work together, we're gonna bypass each other and we'll have even more regulations that don't work. Even more things that are not helpful to people. That's my fear without collaboration. So I asked the question, who's asking for support? Mary Daniel, you've had a little bit of time trying to, to work with the governor of Florida. What are, what are you finding out or the, the health departments? Uh, health departments are so busy worrying about things, you know, in protecting nursing homes, it's hard to get their attention um, on care in my, in my experience. But I'm curious, what are you finding out? Well, I haven't gotten to the governor yet. Um, which is um, a bit frustrating. He knows who I am. He mentioned me twice in press conferences last week. Um, I'm told that his chief of staff has my cell phone number, but um, I've not received a call and I'm going to continue. He needs, to, he needs to talk to me and he needs to talk to us. And that's, um, that's my number one push right now, as Ansley was saying, is communication. I did speak with um, Jared Moskowitz on Sunday, had a actually... 25 minute conversation with him. He is the director of the emergency services division for the state of Florida. His signature is actually on the order, the emergency order that, that uh, stopped visitation. So it was his order. And he, he you know, it was interesting. I, I got a little emotional with him. You know, I've done literally a hundred interviews and I said to him that I am nervous speaking to you um, and I got a little emotional. He, and he said, please don't be nervous. And, and I said, but you were the only one and all the people that I've talked to who can close this door in my face. And I don't know how I'm going to go back to all these people if that happens. And he said, that's not going to happen. And it, and I believe him. He was shocked at the inconsistencies that are happening in the facility. I don't think they've looked. I really don't think they've looked. I mean, I, I think they're so busy. I mean, I think this is so overwhelming that this is a part of it to them, but it's not to us, it's everything. To them, there's a hundred pieces to this puzzle of trying to manage this crisis and that's his job. He is the director of this emergency. You know, he handles hurricanes too. So, you know, I mean, this guy is really, really overworked at the moment, but he's, I mean, he said, that's my number one. When I said to him, the inconsistencies, some people in Florida are not allowing window visits. I mean, some, I mean, it's crazy what, and it's all being made at the, at the center level. If an administrator says, I don't want to do it, they're not doing it. And so you have people that are so desperate. And so that's the first step is to, he said, I'm going to put out an, an immediate order to be certain that everybody knows window visits are not optional. They have to be done. And so that's good news. And then we talked about the steps further from the, the essential caregiver designation, which I like a lot. Um, happening in two states right now. Um, the outside space, the clean rooms that, that were mentioned earlier, I think is also um, a great idea because we need something in the interim. What they're focusing on right now, and, and it was interesting, what he said is 
our number one priority has been to get these rapid tests to facilities for their employees and for the staff, for the staff and the residents. And he said, but after talking to you today, I now know it has to be for the families as well. That's our answer. All right. If we can test you before you walk in the door, then we've got it. He said, Mary, I know September sounds like a long way away, but I think we can get that done by September. And that would be huge. Now, I'd like a few steps in between there, and I'd like the governor to communicate that to the people. He owes it to us, and I'm not done until he has a press conference and he says, I hear you, I know what your worries are, I'm looking at this picture, and here's how we're gonna fix it. But I think ultimately, it's the rapid test at the, at the door is what's gonna get us in. So rapid test at the door, um, so here's my piece to contribute is I think the training before the rapid test. So when you walk in that door, you have strategies, you have skills that are buffed up because again, it's been a while. It's been a while for people in preparing for that time of visitation to walk in the door and to prepare for, but between then and there, we have communication. What is being communicated and how? How are those communications happening? So window visits is one option, but looking at how can families, this idea of families being shut out and staff being overwhelmed, what do we do with that? Because for me, that's a big deal because one of the reasons people aren't getting back with people is they, they can't find, some people can't find moments in the day. Some people don't want to make the call. How do we help people recognize both of those things are not okay? <laughs> That's not care. That's not care. If, if the person has a person in their life that they can't be with, we got to figure out a way that that can be supported. Any well, ideas said, in this group? It, it was interesting. He said to me, the director said to me, I mean, he asked me, why would somebody not do a window visit? I mean, almost like he never even thought of it, you know? I mean, it never really, he they never had time. Staffing. They don't understand the right. limitations of staffing. And that's and what I said. It's a staffing issue, right? And I mean, the other is, I think there's a PR part of this puzzle too, you know, that that it's, it's they want to protect their, um, and, I, and again, I am, I Rose Castle has been amazing to me, so please don't misunderstand this, but I think the ones that are struggling to care for their residents would just prefer that people not see what that looks like. You know, and there's a there's a liability in that and there's a PR issue in that. And so that's another reason where you're not getting communication, whether it be in person or on a technology or phone calls, is they so, don't want to call you to tell you that they have five new positive cases in their facility. You know, right. they prefer, prefer just to keep that to themselves and can we not get past this thing and move on? Yeah. And so we have, go ahead, Maggie. Thanks, Mary. Maggie, your thoughts? Um, talking about the staffing and from the community point of view, it is because like to bring my resident to our big glass doors where we have the window visits, we have to have a des designated staff member with them to help them because we use a speaker phone to make sure they can talk through the window. So there's got to be someone there to make sure the resident doesn't hit all the buttons and make so they can't have the conversation. To do the video chats, we have to have a staff member with them to work that tablet so they can have that communication. So, you know, it is, you know, making sure that the staff is available to do it. So, I mean, we have to do it by appointments. We try so to- Maggie, appointments Okay, so I have, a, I have a curiosity question. It really is a curiosity question. If we could identify a family member who was willing to be a volunteer and get trained, do the kind of training and testing that Mary's talking about, and their sole purpose, their sole purpose, and they were a capable individual, their sole purpose was to be this, this person, and the staff worked with them, and they are the volunteer to do these communication visits. Would that be something that's a possibility to, to, to have that position of a volunteer, is that a possibility? That would be amazing right now with the way our hands are tied with the mandates and everything. Right. We can't have our trained volunteers like pet therapies and stuff even come in so, yet. Yeah, so this is to me, this is that missing piece where we've got to put the puzzle back together and we've got to start getting logical about it. So what we what what I say is 
the, the resources are inadequate in facilities. They don't have enough staff to do it. So many places, if they don't have enough staff to do those visits, they still may have enough staff to do some care. But we have places where they don't have enough staff to do the visits, but we also, quite honest, they don't have enough staff to do the care. The number of people they're caring for who have deteriorated, in other words, they no longer have the physical skills, they no longer have the mental skills, they no longer have the abilities that they had at the start of this in, infection system, they are now being asked to do more with each person, which more, it means more time in intimate space, more time helping people do things that are, comp and sometimes two for one, because helping people roll over in the bed, helping people reposition, helping people move from thing. What we're talking about is we've tied up now two staff rather than one staff, which is the previous behavior, but we haven't got any more staff. We haven't got more staff. We're still limited in staff and we don't have everybody trained in doing this. And if we bring somebody from another unit, ooh, now we've just upped the risk rate. And if we bring in an agency person, yikes, we just upped the risk rate. So we're back to this idea, how do we create a deeper team? How do we create a better team that has commitment and we have some assurance in insurance that we're building this team out in a functional way? Because that doesn't make sense to ask people to do the impossible with the inadequate, <laughs> which is what we're asking for, for families, for staff. And yet there's resources. We have resources. We just aren't using them effectively, given the guidelines that are currently in effect for mm -hmm. me. So any other thoughts? Because we are, we are not done, but... I'm trying to figure out what else do we need to hear? What else do we need to know? I still haven't figured out how we're gonna get this message to CDC. Jennifer, any ideas on getting messages? If we can bring our message together with, with some variations, here's some variations we think are reasonable variations. How do we get our message to move upward in your world? Because you're, you're one of those medical gurus. I, mean, I, I think there there are channels, you know, and, and you, you speak about the, the staffing and, and just to comment on that for a second. I mean, it, that is, it, it's not just that they're doing the same with, they're doing more with the same staff. They're actually doing it with less staff. Yes. I mean, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen a lot of facilities staff goes down. I, I have, people are reacting out of fear, unnecessary fear sometimes. And I've seen staff, especially older staff say, I'm not, I, they quit because they can't, or they have children at home um, that are no longer in school, so they can't work or they have the slight sniffles from allergies and they can't come in. And so most facilities are actually dealing with less staff. And so your idea to bring family members, you know, um, back into the care team is, is important more now than ever, you know, in, in all honesty. And, and I do think there are methods to do that. I mean, the problem is you're dealing with different um, levels of legislation, you know, so you're dealing with national groups like the CDC and CMS for that matter, who have had a lot to say about this. And in, in fact, if you look at CMS's FAQ page about reopening nursing homes, their, their language has got a lot looser and a lot softer in, in a good way in the last couple of weeks, even. Weeks, their it's been just days. the last two weeks in my, in my read on that stuff. Two yeah, weeks. They, they brought in their definition of um, compassionate care because people thought that meant just hospice, et cetera. But now they're saying compassionate care is basically anything that the individual needs um, per CMS, which is, I think, a big step in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and, and very applicable to dementia folks. But I think what Mary's doing and talking a, a local and then bringing it up the chain, because we're also dealing with not just national guidance from CDC, but the state is actually where the law comes from. Yes. Um, CDC is just kind of helping to guide that. But the individual states are the ones that make the decisions about what level of restrictions are or are not in place right now. And we really do have to start there too. Okay, so we're gonna need to get up with some state folks. So here's my question. Do you guys think we should go for pilots? Is that a direction to move that we create some pilot areas where we show people that this can work, this can make a difference? Do we go with pilots versus trying to get a blanket? So I'm, you know, like we're doing throw rugs because we can't figure out how to get a blanket to work. What do you guys yeah. think about that concept? And Tipo, one of the things, whether it's to the good or the bad, we have 
many situations think of a PACE program. This wasn't a fully um, evaluated program before it was rushed into play. Now it has worked out quite well in many areas. So it's not a, you know, we don't actually need a formal research pilot or even evaluation pilot at that level for any state or even CDC to change their guidance. Um, but there are examples and pockets of people who are willing to look at the current guidance and are able to write um, a, a sound argument back to a state, to a regulator, to say, this is what we are care planning for our individuals that are under this. So there's ways to put this forward of not necessarily pilots, but places that already have potentially piloted it. So I think, for example, Mary, your story is just so critical here to talk about the ways in which communities have the power and the ability and the knowledge to move things forward. It's going to take those special places that had, again, that frontal lobe capacity to say, okay, this isn't okay. So I'm wondering, I love the idea of pilots. Are those already complete? And can we as a team or even the Facebook community to start to bring just as important the situations where it's not working, but also the situations where it is working so we can capitalize and interview and figure out through case studies how a particular community has been successful and those can be applied across state lines in terms of recommendations and talking to our states. So Jennifer, are you in some specific communities or are you over a lot of communities and you're not in communities as much anymore? So I'm curious about that piece. Um, so I, I'm still in some for sure, but I, I do help to manage quite a, quite a lot so of them. Are some of the places you have, do you have dementia specific units? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in those units, um, in your, in, in all, in some of your communities, are, are people in the unit, the, the people residents, are they expected to maintain social distance? Um, I, I have seen a variety in that as well, but I it think... A variety. Okay, tell me more about that. Well, um, I think the, the homes that have made a conscious um, choice to, to not follow social distancing inside the unit um, have really fared better. Um, because don't, don't forget, the folks with dementia have multiple relationships. You know, the family members is one of the relationships, but their peers are relationships. Right. That's sure. a lot of their family, yeah. too. Their friends. Yeah. The staff-patient relationship we sometimes forget about, too. But, like, that is a these, – these caregivers are with those patients um, and the residents all day long. And, and I've seen staff suffering because they don't have that close relationship anymore when they try to socially distance. So – I think the homes that have made a, a choice to say, this is our household. We're following the CDC household guidance. Um, right. We all um, stay together all day and, and we, can't, we can't logically keep these people to their rooms. It would be very much, as you mentioned, imprisonment and, 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 and not appropriate care. And nor is it even feasible. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that they've fared a lot better. Okay, cool. So, and Maggie, you guys are still trying this social distancing. Is there any thought in your community that you could, that you could start to let go? You guys have been together. Is there any thought that you can start to do that? Is there this mandate still in, in effect in, in this area that makes it so impossible? They do. They, they gather together. You'll see them walking down the hallways together. Officially in our common areas, we're supposed to keep that social distance. So we make sure on the group activities, we have the spaces. Are but, you I mean, are honestly, getting any closer to letting it go? <laughs> they have best friends. They go walking down the hallways together. They end up watching TV together, but we're still like, you know, we're held together by those mandates too. So, okay, in the so that mandate, if I got sense. rid of that mandate, if we were to get rid of that mandate, that would take the pressure off staff to feel like they've got to do that stuff, which is illogical. I mean, if people are walking together and talking and then they go sit at a table and, and separate at, at distance, it's like, that's illogical. And I know it's illogical, but I also know that that's dementia. People do not want to be at those distances if they don't want to be at those distances. If they do, they do. And you respect that. That's how it works. We spend so much time rearranging furniture. that, <laughs> And it's deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> so this, this idea of let's reallocate your time use into good time use, which is having people help you get people where they need to be doing what they want to be doing. And the tension and distress on staff goes way down because it's like, it's not my job to separate people. It's my job to care for people. That's what it was to start with. And it still is. So taking away that, that guidance that says social distancing in common areas, families 
when you go to the when you go to the custard store to get custard, even for takeout, families don't suddenly when they're in the custard store separate at six feet. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that with with the family. That's illogical. If I came as a family, I am as a family. And this idea that that household model, we should look at household model for, for folks. And we need to invite families to be part of that household model. And developing a plan of, for families who want this, who want to engage back into that essential role. They really want that. Let's build a, a path for that to happen. And for families who want connections on a daily bath, a basis. Let's build a pathway for that to happen. And for, for staff who need relief, let's, let's build a pathway that, that, that helps with bringing in those special volunteers who could be that. And we need two more plans. And one of them has to be for families in community. We got to deal with the families in community too, Marianne, because that, that whole thing, as I think about it, it's just like, so they tested him. Did, he t did they test her at the same time and say, you two are negative? And, and it's like, oh, let's look at how we can support him and not send him to another hospital. Why would we want to send him to another hospital? I don't know. It was very traumatic. But in rural areas, because kind of in the, in the world of the rural area of this country, yeah. I shudder to think what has happened to those because even on a good day, it's not good. And so when someone lives... 20 miles from here, out in the middle of a farm somewhere, they literally, I mean, I had a client who, because she watched Fox News day in and day out, she was so petrified of this, quote, thing, that when she saw our mask, she assumed we had this thing, she said. And so... Um, people living at home is totally different than encased, and yet they're still encased in their home. I will tell Mary that um, because of her story, there was a gentleman who is now the paid, now get this, paid caregiver for his wife. They were both in assisted living. The wife fell, something happened, she had to go to memory care, but because of the hip, she had to have special care, and she had to have a caregiver. Well, they, there was one door that separated them one door. And yet he could not go through that door in the same community and go see his wife and said, I promise you, I'll be good. I'll do all these things. Da, da, da. So long story short, he picks up the phone and calls the caregiving that he's already paying to take care of his wife and says, are you hiring new caregivers? Because he saw Mary's story and they said, well, yes. And he said, well, my wife already has a place there and I just wanted to know and so in credit to that community they really didn't care that he was hired by another company he couldn't go in because it was the it was the community's uh, policy but the caregiving company said well sure what better caregiver so they pay him to go take care of his wife and he got to see her oh that makes me so Mary's happy story. but it's just so convoluted the whole thing no. Going. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever, but he's my kind of guy. I love it. That's that's a great, great story. Great story, but he wanted to see his wife so bad, he sat there by himself and figured it out. So if there was a pathway that was laid out, and if there were pathways where people sign up to be agreeable to that pathway, that allows us to have ways back in that work for people. Um, so, Okay. Now, we haven't got somebody who's one of the hands-on care staff in the buildings. And, you know, that to me, and we don't have people who are living with dementia on this conversation today. Um, and we, we, we need to. We, we should have them as part of this conversation. Ansley does some of the stories. But one of the things I would say is the demands on them, not only in the, in the facilities where they're working, but then in their lives. Um, because it is not uncommon for people who are doing this kind of work to go home and do it at home as well. Um, they go home and grandma's at home. They go home and they have a mother or a husband at home or a brother or a sister, or they go home and they do a very similar thing to what they're doing at work at home, or they have other people that they're responsible for at home. And they're trying to figure out how do I balance these things. And there is so little respect paid for these individuals. And we minimize their in economics, we minimize their skill training, we minimize the opportunities to, to get to different places and do different things. 
And it's, it's one of those things you've got to have incredible determination that this is your career path to be in here, or you've got to be stuck. And we don't want people who feel stuck. We want people who really see the value of what they do and love what they do. And we have a lot of people in our communities that are definitely in that category. But to figure out what support they need as we move forward, what would help them? Because we're asking them to do this very risky work. Um, because now when I'm walking into someone's room who's been in isolation, their reaction to me and my only time with them is a care thing rather than, and I'm wearing a mask and I'm wearing gloves and I don't look or sound like the same person they're used to. This can put me in a much higher risk category for them negatively to interact with me because it seems that I'm coming in and trying to rape you or, or, or shove you or do things to you when all I'm trying to do is help. But this, this idea of masking, this is, this is not something that most of us are familiar with somebody coming up with gloves and a mask. And I'm sure you've seen the ads for the political, but this is a signal and a symptom of, I don't feel safe with, the person who's looking at me may not, may not feel safe with me. And so we've made my job harder. And are there times and places in which if you don't have anything and I don't have anything and we're, we don't have anything in our other spaces and we do proper support and care that we should be able to be mass free. When are we in that setting able to be mass free? And I think that's a real question at some point we've got to start asking when and if could we be mass free with certain people? Um, and should we look at shields rather than masks? in certain situations because they allow my face to be seen and it doesn't have the same, you can see my whole face. This looks very different than I look through a shield. So even those kind of questions, I think we've got to start separating out where are shields may be more appropriate um, for people living with dementia and when are masks okay, um, but they create an emotional reaction. Uh, for people who are in more involved states of dementia or have a history of bad things happening. Um, so we ha I had a case where a gentleman had recently been robbed in his home and the people had worn masks when they did it. And now he's in a community and people are going to come in and give care to him with masks on. There's higher risk in those situations simply because that emotional memory of being robbed by somebody in a mask. Now they're going to come in and do care. Yikes. So now his risk of being sent out to a behavior psych center, behavior management center is quite high or medication is quite high, which diminishes his quality of life in a setting that we brought him into for better quality of life. So do you feel like we have some sort of game plan that isn't actually all put together, but we have something that we could start to move together and, and bring up and raise up and we could get back together and lay out some of the things we've thought about and think that we could put something together that is more than any one of us could do together. What are you guys thinking out there and here? What's, what's the thought of the group? Do we have some action steps? What are you feeling? Feels like we've got, oh, so go ahead, Corey. I was just going to bring up something, Tifa, that you and I had talked about. Um, I've been watching the feed on Facebook, and there's a lot of emotion out there. For um, sure. And, and, and of course, it's, it, but it's coming from both sides. We've got families who can't see their loved ones or only get limited time. We've got staff who are completely overwhelmed and feel like they don't have a lot of choice in this. Um, I think it's really important to think about how we can engage in a conversation that's not emotional, but is really coming from a place of, this is horrible for us, this is horrible for you, and how can we work together? What are they doing in some other places um, to really build a community team? And it's- A relationship. Yep. So we need to work on relationships. So we need to allow people to have emotion because people need to let it out. When we let it out, but it has to be let out in a safe space. So maybe offering some opportunities for emotional out and sharing of information with that emotion. 
from each group and then bringing the groups together. So this is what people are feeling and thinking, and this is how we might could put this together into an actions plan. Because there's a lot of emotion and emotion without thinking is just emotion and it sort of can escalate itself. And that's not our goal. Our goal is to feel something and then do something with what we feel, which is what Mary has been so very successful at. And what those of us who have, have felt that, no, this is not okay. How do we figure this out? But we got to get through this is not okay. Um, and and we've gotta be coming, from, coming from that place of curiosity. Yeah. I, I can assume all sorts of things about the job that you're doing in the facility, but I'm not the one doing it. And so really no. looking at it. Yeah. And so we're back to our, our, at PAC, we have that relationships that are built on curiosity, authenticity, compassion, with the goal of empowering. So that idea of that's what we use in the work that we do, and maybe using that to help more of these conversations happen. So what we might want to think about is how we do that. How do we do that in short order? Because we don't want to foster arguments or disagreements or confrontations. That's not what we're about. But we are into solving things and, and creating potential opportunities for making things different. So looks like our team may need to pull together, but we are very interested in anybody else who wants to be part of this team. Like it's not like uh, a company event. It's like a community event. So anybody who is interested in having conversations of curiosity, of authentic interest, of compassion with one another, um, and, and really wanting to empower people living with dementia and their families and their staffs to do a better job and, and to allow CDC to have better guidance for people living with dementia. Cause I just think they didn't think, and, and the States are not thinking about people living with dementia. They don't even see them. Um, they're hidden away and in quote unquote, where they think are safe spaces. And it's like with people giving care and it's like, but those people are wearing out guys and families are not part of it. And that's not working. And so we got to bring it up again. So, We've got some work to do. Um, sounds like we have to really create some forums for more discussions because we've got to get the emotion out of the way so we can start doing the planning. And we've got to let people emote and, and people need to share what they need to share. I think that's, Jennifer, any thoughts from the psych background? People need to share stuff out. It's not going to go away unless we get it out there and let people explore it a little bit. And that, that's exactly true. And, and if people can do that um, from different sides and be respectful for each other, and then, like you said, join back together. I mean, getting the, getting the discussion out there and open and people feeling comfortable to have that conversation will breed the cooperation needed from the caregivers, from the home side, from the medical side, from the family side. And together, getting all of us together is really what it will take. And, and getting the emotion out first will, will help. I agree. So it looks like we have some work to do. People on our team who are interested in, in hosting and supporting this kind of conversational opportunities. This is where we, we want to bring people into community who need to get it out there and then bring people into community after they've had an opportunity to let go of some of that frustration, anger, sadness. Because at this point we're talking about, I am in some cases, I am furious, I am hopeless, I feel imprisoned, I feel, I feel abandoned, I feel terrified, or I feel useless. And those feelings are intense feelings of distress. And so helping people go from that to feeling angry, to feeling irritated, and being able to bring the amygdala back down to a place where we can have thought in combination with emotion. Oof, yeah, that's gonna make a difference. We know that in dementia, that's exactly what we do with people who are living with brain failure, is if we can't help them express distress and understand the distress and what's driving the distress, we can't change the situation in a meaningful way. So I think for now, We've achieved a lot in this roundtable, and I want to thank 
everybody who came. And I particularly want to thank Mary and Jennifer and Maggie and Beth and Marianne and Ansley and Corey, most particularly, um, for running this thing. And I want to thank all the PAC team who decided to come and spend an hour and a half and the PAC supporters around the globe, because this isn't just an American issue, should we think that it is. Um, it's everywhere. And so next steps will be, I'll be seeking some people to offer opportunities for conversations so we can get the emotions out and start having the conversations together. Um, and we'll figure out that specific, but it's pretty clear putting people together without some work ahead of time will typically not result in what we're looking for, which is venues for change, creating these, these pathways. And we can only create pathways when we can talk with one another with respect. And Mary has demonstrated how well that works and, and that's what we're working toward. So next up, conversations. Maggie, thank you so much. Jennifer, thank you so much. Mary Ann and Mary, thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. Thank you, Tipa. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Hey folks, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to help us spread Tipa's positive approach message around the world. And don't forget to click the bell to get notified when new videos are posted.